We've come now to the second to last issue of 1995 with Nintendo Power number 71 for April. We have a movie license game this issue. Our cover game of this issue is Stargate, and the cover is a painting instead of a promotional photo or a snippet from the movie poster, so I kind of approve of this. In the letters column, we have a lot of praise for the new format. In the power charts, Tetris and Dr. Mario, the double pack, is now new to the Super Nintendo ranking this time, and F-Zero is back on the charts. The genre ranking for this issue is for top 10 fighting games, and it is not platform specific. So we have both the Super Nintendo and Game Boy versions of Mortal Kombat 2 on the ranking. That seems somewhat unreasonable. I like would probably, if I was doing this, do it where it's only one version of a game is permitted on there. So it is so the best version of Mortal Kombat 2 is the version that makes the list. For example, and also entering the Hall of Fame, we have Final Fantasy, Kirby's Dreamland, and Baseball Stars. In the wake of Masks from Carnage, Acclaim has gotten another Spider-Man game on the Super Nintendo, this time based on the Fox animated series. We have maps of the first three levels, including boss fights against Doc Ock and the Tri-Spider Slayer. Spider-Man is kind of a mess. To the game's credit, when you go down, you get right back up wherever you fell. However, the limited number of continues, numerous cheap hits and level designs, including enemies shooting at you from off-screen, makes for a game that will eventually keep you down. Yes, I, I went there. But seriously, attacking, swinging, and in particular doing jump attacks is enough of a mess to make playing the game not particularly fun. And when swinging is not fun in a Spider-Man game, you're doing something wrong. We have more codes this issue for NBA Jam Tournament Edition, including codes for the Beastie Boys, and also, in a odd fit, Hillary Rodham Clinton, which would make Hillary the first woman to be a playable character in a basketball game that has the official license of a major sporting organization. Hmm. The first film license game of this issue is not our cover game, but instead the license of Adam's Family Values. It seems apropos since we've got a new Adams Family movie coming out this month. This time, Ocean shifts the perspective from a side-scrolling platformer to a Zelda-style adventure game. Actually, kind of like Fester's Quest, but without the horrible shot upgrade scheme. The article gives maps of the first few dungeons. Adams Family Values is interesting. It's a lot less deliberately obnoxious than the earlier games, both by giving you a map earlier on to help you make your way through the area, and a stronger sense of direction with actual bosses to fight. By can contrast, the earlier games feel like, well, a 2D version of the Banjo-Kazooie games in Donkey Kong 64. Consequently, Adam Family Values is a much stronger game, though it's still somewhat obtuse in some areas, like when it comes to navigating the individual sectors of the environment. It's still a lot easier to recommend than the other Adams Family titles. We continue with the movie license games with our cover game, Stargate, a side-scrolling run-and-gun game based on the film with maps of most of the game in this article. Stargate, as far as action movie license games go, is surprisingly good. It's not great, but it's pretty good. The run-and-gun action is great, and you're able to shoot in eight directions, as well as being able to fire from ledges and while hanging on from ropes. Additionally, you can hang from ledges, giving some additional wiggle room when it comes to navigating the game's environments. The level environments, while large, are still quite manageable, and character movements are very fluid. Further, your gun has unlimited ammo instead of having a cooldown, which determines when you can shoot again, which works well with, also with the fact that the gun is a hit-scan weapon, as opposed to having bullets shot on screen, which also works really well. On the minus side, the way the game's attack animations work makes hitting enemies low to the ground kind of clunky, as you have to manually crouch to toggle as well, and the game doesn't use the right shoulder button fairly well. I feel like it could have been used to lock off movement and allow aiming in all directions while standing still, to using a toggle crouch, or locking off aiming and allowing the player to hold the direction they're aiming while moving. But instead, it doesn't do too much at all. 
The Epic Center starts this issue with a... The Epic Center starts this issue with a discussion on the differences between an RPG, a strategy game, adventure game, and a simulation. On the news front, we have a Super Nintendo spin-off of the Ultima series with the title or subtitle of The Savage Empire, which adapts one of the Worlds of Ultima games, which are very loosely tied with the main Ultima um, storyline and instead basically are meant to be a subtitle for games using the Ultima engine. There are some notes on the Scratch and Stiff card and strategy guide that will ship with Earthbound. And finally, Romance of the Three Kingdoms 4 is coming out, but the header screws up the numbering and lists it as the third game. We have a review and strategy article for the start of the Ogre Battle and Tactics Ogre series, Ogre Battle March of the Black Queen, a double queen reference. We get a bunch of notes on the nuts and bolts of the game. High and low alignment, how you want to... They want units with high alignment to liberate towns, units with lower alignment to press the attack, and also we you want weaker units, or I should say lower level units, to get finishing blows in on higher level or equal leveled units. Notes on time of day, units with low alignment for better night attacks, whereas units with high alignment should be attacking during the daytime. And notes on the reputation meter, along with hints on how the game has multiple endings based on where your reputation meter is by the game's conclusion. Ogre Battle, March of the Back Black Queen, is a game that I've played a bunch in emulators, but I've never really been able to get good at, for a large part because of how some of the game mechanics work. As I mentioned earlier, your units lose alignment when fighting weaker units, and defeating enemy units pushes those units back to the enemy base, meaning that towards the end of a match, you have a very real possibility of having to face a whole bunch of weaker enemies before you finally reach the boss, all of them with stronger units who've been leveling up and getting stronger over the course of the game. It makes for a game that I do like a great deal because of what this game leads to, but though this game I'll just want, I will probably only be really be able to ever appreciate through Let's Plays. In the new workshop column, we get a look behind the scenes of the next RPG from Square. Secret of Evermore, which has Square USA taking point, which is kind of a first here. There's a discussion of how the developers of the game decided on the look and feel as well as the story of the work. There's also the awkward bit of Jeremy's soul being interviewed in the score. Awkward because as of the month I'm recording this, immediately at the start of the month, September, it had came out that Soul had sexually and professionally abused several women who had worked under him and had bullied other subordinates. And that's without getting into the relatively lesser issue by comparison of him ghosting his Kickstarter. The good news is, as of this recording, Soul has already been paid whatever he was supposed to get paid for the game. So if you pick a copy of this up, you don't have to worry about him putting money into the pocket of someone who abuses his subordinates and abuses the trust of his Kickstarter backers. So, you got that going for you in terms of, okay, buying a copy of this game guilt-free. We wrap up the column with the maps of the... We wrap up this column with maps of the ruins area of the dungeon crawler game Brandish, with specifically maps of the two levels of the basement and ten of the upper levels, or lower upper levels, of the dungeon. Brandish is an RPG that gets some crap due to the camera perspective. Crap that is half-earned and half-not-earned. It's half unearned because I didn't have that much of an issue early on with figuring out which way my character was oriented and, consequently, figuring out how to navigate from there. It's half-earned due to how it is implemented. My way of explanation to those who are listening to the video and not watching it, in Brandish, your character is always facing forward, and the character turns in 90 degree increments, and when they turn, the environment rotates, but not their sprite. However, the camera is partially isometric, so there are certain things like cracks, switches, and doors that can only be seen on a wall if you're facing in that direction. I'd just thus describe this game as playing like Eye of the Beholder or Ultima Underworld, where instead of controlling a party, you control one character, or other... Consequently, I'd describe this game as playing like Eye of the Beholder or Ultima Underworld, 
where instead of controlling a party, you only control one character, and instead of being in the first person, you're in a third person perspective that is a little above and behind the protagonist. It's definitely a playable game, but it's one that takes a little bit of work to get used to. This issue also has another Sports Center column, but there isn't much of interest in this issue outside of the increasingly more arcadey and over the top Super Baseball Simulator 1000 or 1.002. We have another fluff article leading into the release of the N64, again talking about the partnership between Nintendo and Silicon Graphics on the N64, along with bringing up some software partners and other developers. They make some questionable associations in this article, though, like showing a still from an FMV sequence in Wing Commander 3, giving the impression that the N64 can play the contemporary Wing Commander games when it can't. And I'm not talking like FMV sequence like, oh, full motion video of pre-rendered pre fighters doing dogfights in a cutscene. No, no, I mean like with the live action actors on sets. That part of Wing Commander 3. In the classified information column, we get a code for Pitfall that lets you skip to level 6. We have one more licensed game this issue with Bonkers, based on the moderately sh short-lived sort of Disney animated series. Oh, maybe less short-lived. It lasted 61 episodes, which is respectable, uh, but not necessarily, say, Batman the Animated Series numbers. It looks like there's some non-linearity in the game, and going from the guide is it gives you the opportunity to select what order you do levels in. Bonkers is an interesting, though flawed, platformer. I played a lot of games based on Saturday morning cartoons with a very deliberately cartoony, expressive visual design. And they've had a varying degrees of difficulty and varying degrees of expressiveness. With Bonkers, the difficulty is about right for the concept of the series and the general difficulty, as the game gives you three offensive verbs with different attacks being more useful against different types of enemies. And after the first level, giving you the opportunity to make the successive three episode, three levels available in any order. It even has unlimited continues and the ability to continue being based on your tolerance for bad jokes. Where things get not so good is that the cartoonishness of the game never really comes at the fore. Occasionally bonkers being a tune in, will come up in damage animations. He'll take fire damage and be scorched and blackened with the suit. Occasionally he'll be smashed flat by running into things, but these incidents are very much the minority. Otherwise, if we take damage, we'll have a OW speech balloon and take some light knockback, and that's it. It's actually kind of disappointing in more than a few respects. Next up is Air Cavalry, a helicopter flight simulator that appears to make heavy use of Mode 7 graphics. The guide has notes on the first three areas of the game. The Middle East, Central America, and Indonesia, along with notes that you should take care to avoid friendly fire. Air Cavalry is a simulator that has learned nothing from the lessons of other simulator games. Its controls are clunky and makes it difficult to adjust your loadout before a mission to reflect the requirements of the mission objectives. And it also utterly fails to provide a way in game to resupply after you start a mission to allow you to adjust your loadout and resupply particular weapons as needed. By comparison, the strike games have drops throughout the mission to allow you to resupply, including a few that restock your weapons and fuel. Um, the helicopter and jet fight simulator, Joint Strike Command, had its whole mechanism being, okay, optimizing your time over the target. You would launch, you would do your attack, you'd hit your targets, you'd go back to base, you'd take, you'd refuel, rearm, switch out planes, depending on what you need to do next, and then launch again, and you have a limited time window. Here you have a limited number of lives and a number of targets, and once you run out of an enemy type of ammunition, then that's it. On top of that, before each mission, the game shows you a map of the level area without any actual context to help you plan. You get some general information on where the hard and soft targets are, but you don't get any information on where your insertion point is, so you can plot your route through the level. It is, in short, a damn mess. 
and I do not recommend playing this game without the use of some sort of Game Genie or Pro Action Replay code to provide for unlimited health and ammunition. Our next title is a Defender-inspired shooter from Psygnosis called Archer McLean's Super Drop Zone, a sequel to an Atari 8-bit game that was fairly successful in the UK with notes on three worlds in the game, all moons of Jupiter, Io, Callisto, and Ganymede. I'm not covering this game, though, because this game never got a US release, and it's the release that did come out is PAL region only, which makes things a little tricky for people who choose to import it due to the difference in frame rate, and that's a hardwired into the console thing. I mean, if it was Japanese release, that's NTSC, that's a common standard. This, not so much. Next is another Pac-Man game from Namco, this time a platformer with Pac in time. Ha ha. There are notes on four levels, and I have no idea how Pac-Man in a character f as a character fits into this game and why someone like Mappy wouldn't work better instead. While Pack in Time is published by Namco, it is not developed by Namco. Instead, being from a European developer with a heavy background on the Amiga. Not to take a shot at Amiga games, but notice the way some Amiga platformers handle movement but they will have the character accelerate as the joystick or arrow key is held in a particular direction instead of having a constant rate of speed with the run function being something you opt into by holding down a button while moving like with Super Mario Brothers. The Amiga style of movement makes, in my view, platforming kind of clunky and it definitely does not work well on an actual controller like with the Super Nintendo. The problem is, Pack in Time uses that Amigo style of platforming. It uses those that form of acceleration with held input, as opposed to having you hold down a button to to run, which is notable because the game doesn't use every button on the controller. So there's an available button that you could use for, you know, running. So, consequently, while this game is designed for the Amiga-style platforming in mind, it's still counterintuitive compared to other platformers, and it definitely makes it less fun to play, especially considering the plethora of much better platformers on the Super Nintendo. Give this game a miss. Our last Super Nintendo game of the issue is Bust a Move, featuring the triumphant return of Bub and Bob to a 16-bit game in a puzzle game. Bust a Move, as a game, I found works best if you have the aiming power up, which the game generally gives you on your first board after continue. This is mainly because I found the controller does not give you a level of precision in aiming, that works with the game, well, with the game's boards, and it does require a level of precision. Give me a trackball? Sure. Mouse? No problem. Arcade stick? Maybe. D-pad? I'm gonna need some form of an assist. Continuing with puzzle games as we go to the Game Boy, we have Mario's Picross, the start of the long-running puzzle game franchise that continues to this day. We get notes on how to play this mix of Minesweeper and Sudoku at a time where most people don't know what Sudoku is. Well, as with Sudoku, I can't figure out a Picross puzzle without some sort of hint, without having some values started out for me. That said, the gameplay in Picross is incredibly intuitive and easy to pick up and learn. It is also incredibly addictive. Like, I probably, given unlimited time and hard drive space, have captured a complete run of this game. It's also shockingly affordable, enough so that I should probably just pick a copy of this game up for my collection. We move on to the first of two Super Nintendo ports of the issue, with the Game Boy port of The Lion King, and with maps of the first four levels. The Lion King on the Game Boy is, frankly, a drastically inferior title to the Super Nintendo version of the game. While the animations are on par with the Super Nintendo version, the platforming controls are absolutely terrible to the point of adding an unnecessary amount of difficulty to a bunch of the jumps in the early area of the games due to how collision with the platforms works. It's, it's a mess. 
The other port this issue is Jurassic Park Part 2, which appears to have taken a dramatically different visual style and mechanical structure to the Super Nintendo counterpart. Jurassic Park Part 2, on the other hand, is distressingly easy and actually pretty darn boring. The, each level requires you to find a bunch of key cards before you exit the level, but the key cards are re really easy to find, in some cases spawning right in front of you as you make your way forward. Considering all the other Jurassic Park games, the lack of difficulty in this title is actually rather shocking. Among the also rands in the now playing column, we have Apocalypse 2, not sure what happened to Apocalypse 1, Home Improvement, and Monster Truck Wars. Finally, in Pack Watch, we have another edgy, or as much as you can get edgy in this portion of the 90s on a console, mascot platformer coming out with Boogerman, along with a Game Boy version of Jungle Strike, and more info on the cancelled Super Nintendo version of Goldeneye, enough that makes me wonder if there's a prototype of the game out there. Finally, we get a look at the Super Nintendo version of the X-Band modem. My pick of the week, kind of a split here. I like Picross. I like Picross a lot. There are also a lot of ways to play Picross. Um, certainly picking up this version of the game is part of the Game Boy is, is going to be a fun game. But there's plenty of other versions out there which add 3D to the mix, which add color to the mix. Um, so there is, is in the other sense so many other versions to, to choose from on your phone, on your Nintendo Switch, outside from the Game Boy version that that version's kind of a wash. Um, certainly if you're looking for more Game Boy games to add to your collection, I definitely recommend picking Picross up. My other pick, though, is Brandish. Um, we don't see that many, like, ports of Brandish compared to other game RPGs of this era. I mean, you actually don't see very few remakes of RPGs in this era in general. I mean, outside of the Final Fantasy series, um, Ogre, uh, Tactics Ogre, which we I mean, we didn't get until it got the PlayStation remake. But like other than that, not as much. So there's that to go with. So like, it's one the hard branch is a game that I it's one that I wanted to keep playing after wrapping up this issue. Only like a little less than Picross, but not too much less. And then again, also partially that's because I have Picross for the Switch. So again, there's that. Whereas like Ogre Battle, I feel less comfortable. Like with that game, that the thing is like bad. But there's enough fiddly bits under the hood that I can never, that I can't quite get my hands on in playing it myself, where I feel more comfortable experiencing that game through a Let's Play than through directly playing it myself, or at least watching a Let's Play first and then playing it myself once I have a better handle on things and how some of the strategic mechanisms work. Next time... We wrap up this year of Nintendo Power, and we'll get our results for the Nestor Rewards. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. I also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.